Good evening. I'm Lindsay Winship, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the Claw Studio here at the Royal Opera House and to this insight supported by Rolex. Tonight, we're going to go behind the scenes at Lost Dog's upcoming work, Ruination, which opens at the Limbury Theatre here on the 1st of December. Lost Dog's artistic director, Ben Duke, has had a run of successes retelling classic stories, from Paradise Lost to Romeo and Juliet to A Tale of Two Cities, all using his particular blend of dance, theatre and humour. Ruination is based on the Greek myth of Medea, now, a story about a woman who murders her own children is not obvious material for a Christmas show, but through the eyes of Lost Dog, we're bound to see a new perspective on this much maligned character. Later, we're going to see some of the performers in rehearsal, but now, to learn more about the show and the creative process, please welcome Lost Dog's artistic director, Ben Duke, and director of the Royal Ballet, Kevin O'Hare. Thanks both for joining us. <laughs> Thanks. Good evening. Hi. So, this is an alternative festive show. Could you tell us about how it came about? Shall I answer that? Go on, you go first, <laughs> you go first. Um, Kevin asked me to make a show. <laughs> <laughs> it was that simple. Yeah, yeah. it was a, an invitation. Um, we had been here uh, with a show, which maybe we're going to talk about a bit in a moment, Juliet and Romeo. So we'd been in the building whenever that was, performing that show. And it was a conversation around, um, yeah, something that could kind of sit in the limbry over the Christmas period, something that kind of made sense in the building and made sense at this time of year. And... Uh, yeah, that was kind of it. It was quite a surprise. I was quite. It was quite a surprise. Yeah, it was quite a surprise. <laughs> yeah, the idea. Yes, it was. It was a surprising kind of um, offer, I suppose, for me. A delightful what you, offer. What were you thinking when you when you asked Ben? Why did you ask Ben? Well, I love his work. I've I've been a big fan for a long time and seen so many of the different shows, and uh, and I think even though it's a very different take on what we do. He loves taking the big stories and turning them on their head or looking at them from a different perspective. And that's what I think is so fun about having uh, the other theater in, in this great building. You know, so you have the big stage, but we also have this other gorgeous, we were just saying about it, isn't it? It's a beautiful little theater, the Limbury, and, how, and what you can do with that and how that could link with what we're doing at the time. And so it, there was a synergy when we did the, we were doing Romeo and Juliet when we did Juliet and Romeo. And, you know, to have gone and seen that show, um, to be, you know, I'm there every night watching our Romeo and Juliet and then going down, I remember on, on the Sunday and seeing this really fantastic take on, on, on the story. And, and also with a nod to the, to the work as well, the, the ballet, you know. So I, I just thought, and I think I said to you, what can we do? Mm. I went back that night and said, what could we do? And then from that, you know, Emma Southworth, who's the creative producer of the, for the Royal Ballet, but for the Limbry programs particularly, and she's always looking across the whole, the whole season, how we can slot in different aspects of our work and make them, you know, work well together. And so this, this is where it came up. But Lost Dog aren't a ballet company, obviously, so why is it important to you to bring in different types of work into the building? Well, I think it's very much about um, a creative exchange. You know, having different companies in the building at the same time, there's, it's really special. And it, it might be as simple as dancers crossing over and chatting to each other at, in the break or in class, or actually coming and seeing the work. And then, you know, you know what our studios are like here, you can look into the, all of them. And so, I, I, you know, your dancers are probably looking at ours and seeing them starting to get ready for Nutcracker, which mm. you'll hear is a little bit of part of this, and, uh, and then vice versa. And I think that in itself is something that's really exciting to me. And, you know, there's, Yes, they're not a ballet company, but I think we're all coming from the same sort of, with the same energy to what we want to do on stage. So what was your first response, Ben, when Kevin asked and said it was going to be a, a, a winter show or Christmas? Um, yeah, I, I, I think I was trying to think about what story... 
Yeah, I mean, really simply, I find that my brain often does this thing of just, it's naturally contrary. So, so the idea of a Christmas show, I try to think of the least Christmassy thing I can. <laughs> And, and then it's not very, the least Christmas, you know, you land on Medea as the kind of opposite, the opposite of Christmas. And um, then I, so it's almost like that, it's like a dare or, or, or a suggestion from some part of my brain, like that's the least Christmassy th thing I can think of, let's do that. And, and then, yeah, yeah, it's as kind of simple as that, I suppose. And what's the meaning for you being in this building? I know that, I mean, you thought about the fact of just where the theatre, the Limbury Theatre is. Yeah. Yes, so exactly. I mean, th I mean, there's lots of things about being in this building as, as some, someone who's kind of, uh, I don't know, I feel like I slightly approach dance from the outside or, or I came to dance very late in life, so I have this feeling of kind of, uh, yeah, some, some sense of being outside the, the, the dance world and kind of looking, looking in. But, but having a kind of endless fascination with it as well. So, so for me, this build, I mean, there's things about this building, Kevin touched on that already, this idea of like big stories and, cause that, I, that, that's the same thing. I'm interested in, in stories and how dance can or can't actually tell stories. Um, and then th this idea of the limbry being this place that sits underneath, not quite literally, but almost literally underneath the main stage making me think about a kind of alternate version or a kind of shadow world or, or a space in the basement where we are doing our thing while the Nutcracker is happening kind of upstairs. Yeah, and I mean, this piece is sort of set in the underworld, am yeah. I right? Yeah. yeah, it is, yeah, 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 it's the underworld. So, so the audience come, I'm sure some of you know the Limbry, but you come into the Limbry and then you're you, you go down, you, you go down to get to the Limbry and then you go down even more once you're in the Limbry. Was it a car park? What was it? It was something underneath. <laughs> yeah. There was the car park at one point yeah. because we used to have the scenery in the floor, uh, the Hammond Hall used to be that scenery and right. then the car park was next door. So yeah, I think it yeah. was all there. And of course that far, when we redid the Limbry, we found the River Fleet down there as well. Yeah. And actually it was really a good thing that we changed it because at some point, I think the River Fleet was coming into the Limbry. So uh, that would have added... That, no, no, it exactly. been Tom mentioned show, that. Yeah, he spoke about that and, and then talking about the rivers of the underworld. I was like, wow, let's, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, maybe it will if yeah. the weather continues. <laughs> yes. We'll have this yeah. sense of the, the, the water, yeah. And so what about, when you came to thinking about Medea, what story did you want to tell about her? Um, I guess I'm, I guess I'm interested in the retelling of things and kind of this, these characters that exist. I mean, she's a mythical character and she appears on stage, I mean, a lot recently, actually. So, so this idea of retelling and looking at that, there's always something, I suppose, around characters who do these things that I cannot understand. And I guess that's true for most of us to imagine this thing that she does or is accused of doing is unimaginable. And I'm always drawn to those moments of like, what, what is that? Because, because on stage, there's these things that happen and characters do these really extreme things. And I'm interested in kind of almost getting in there and going, but if that was me or if that was someone I knew, like, what, what is that decision and what does it mean? So this is kind of domesticating or this kind of, yeah, this kind of getting into that thing around the day. And also just this idea of um, who's telling that story, I suppose. So is there a version of this story which perhaps isn't the one that Euripides tells, which involves her um, killing, killing her children? So, so this idea of multiple versions or retelling of versions. Uh, yeah, so it's something around that that was interesting to yeah. me. And so when you began, I mean, did you start with Euripides? Did you start with a text or...? Yeah, I mean, yes. So I started with that Euripides version and um, had seen, whenever that was, a few years ago, the amazing um, Helen McCrory version at the National, which was kind of in my head, because that was a production that had, had worked with dance quite a lot. So that was kind of there, and that version of hers, it's incredibly kind of intense, strong thing and amazing, and then me thinking about what... What is, what's, what's another version of that, or what's a different take on this character? Um, so starting with, yes, that well-known version, I mm. suppose. I mean, in case anyone isn't, isn't as au fait 
I mean, the, the sort of the central thrust of the story is that she's married to Jason. She helps him. Yes. So yes. Steal the golden fleece, and then he betrays her. Then he betrays and her. And her sort of revenge. Yeah. On him is. Yeah. So he he got, he marries a he 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 explains it as a kind of political marriage, a marriage that's going to help him, and he, he almost pitches it like it's this is good for all of us. But essentially, he's going off with a younger woman. She's not happy about it, yeah. and uh, wreaks. Yeah, a, a pretty extreme uh, uh, revenge, oh, yeah. Mm. yeah. And so tell me a bit about the creative process. I mean, I think you start, you live in Sussex and you have a studio, you work in there and you had all the dancers down there with you. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about that and how it works. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I live in a, in a housing community and there's a space there that we use for rehearsal. So everyone comes down there and it's a bit like a kind of uh, retreat, I suppose, like people are living together, eating, rehearsing. It's quite intense, but it's good because it's just, you know, a way of everyone getting to know each other and us kind of going fully into the process. So we, we spent uh, three weeks, four weeks there, and then we came here. And then it started to feel a bit real. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Then it starts to feel real. Yes. Exactly. And when you're working with the performers, how are you... I mean, you use dance and movement and you use text. How do you decide what's going to be danced, what's going to be spoken, how does that mix come about? Um, yeah, I don't know. It, it, it's, um, I guess I think mainly in words, so often there's a kind of, there's a process of not exactly writing a script, but kind of offering scenes and improvising scenes and trying to structure things. And then during that, I guess I'm looking for the bits that I feel can yeah, kind of drop. I guess very simply, I would think of dance as this thing that sits underneath text or that, that kind of goes into this kind of lower emotional realm. So I guess if we're telling the story here, I keep looking for when can we fall through the cracks into dance. And it doesn't always work like this, but the ideal process would be lots of words and an increasing shift to less and less words and more and more dance. So it's kind of doing this. But it's more haphazard than that, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. But I suppose you have the best of both worlds, because text can give you the specificity, but dance can maybe yeah. dig deeper into those mo yeah. emotional moments. Yeah. I mean, there's ballet mime, isn't there, which is often trying to give specifics, but we kind of yeah. lost that language of, of, of people offering details. So I think dance tells amazing stories, or it tells the kind of not the simple stuff, but it tells the kind of basic stuff, like, again, this feeling of what's underneath. But it can't kind of say, um, oh, yeah, I just got on the 10, 15 train, and now I'm meeting and me and you're late. And it can't deal with that kind of detail very well, I don't think. I got, I got in trouble once with a friend of mine who works for the Royal Shakespeare Company when I was working there. And uh, I said, oh, but the ballet is so much better at telling the story than, <laughs> than the play. You know? And that's obviously where I come from. And, and I suppose what we try and do here, and again, there's the similarities is because of the text that you have, but we want to be as natural as we can be telling a story, you know, even though it's classical ballet and you're wearing tights and all the things and point shoes, um, but we want to do it in as real a way as possible. And I think the mixture between the text and the dance can do that and finds a way in. But as, as you've just said, you know, I think then it can get to the heart of the real story mm. that that because I think what I believe that you're trying to do is telling that story behind the headline really mm. of this is who Medea was mm. and I think that's what the dance can really sometimes do yeah yeah I agree I mean, this piece is a co-production with the Royal Ballet so what does that actually mean in practical terms he does all the work, <laughs> and, and Emma, <laughs> with uh, Daisy, does all the putting the production together. But, I mean, it's, it's really about um, collaboration, really. And uh, I love it because, of course, the Limbury is this, um, as we've just said, a, an amazing space. But, of course, the Royal Ballet can't be in there all the time because mm. we're busy doing our shows up here. And so it's a really great opportunity to offer it to uh, companies from across the spectrum of dance, really. And so people like Ballet Black come regularly and Northern Ballet, and then to be able to actually help really co-produce a show for a company like Lost Dog that we really believe in and we really want to help as much as possible because 
um, they're furthering the art form, and I think that's really important, you know, and uh, again, a lot of freelancers over the last few years that have really suffered, you know, with the pandemic. Again, it's a great opportunity to bring people into the building and, and work together and hopefully create something, you know, fantastic. I think also I, I, we did try to say we were, get, we were hoping maybe we could get some Royal Ballet dancers in could, yeah. in the show as well, which is uh, anybody that knows our schedule is hard. But there's a, we've got a reference because at one point um, Ben was like, oh, he sent me an email, oh, is this crazy? But what are they doing in the interval of the Nutcracker? You know, <laughs> could they come by? You know, and, I, and I love the idea of people you know, sort of taking the, the <laughs> one costume off to put the next one on and just saying hello to the audience in, in the limbo. But yeah. we didn't quite manage that. He said no. Yeah, I <laughs> said no. I, I hate admit saying no. Yeah. <laughs> is there a Nutcracker reference in the piece? Yeah, yes, yes, there is a Nutcracker reference. I mean, the, the idea is that the sense sometimes of the... Yeah, th th that it's happening above, so, that, so, that, so the kind of music filters through or the sense of it filters through. And, and there's a um, Hades, the, law, the, the king of, what is he? King of the underworld, god of the underworld, is, um, he's a big fan of the Nutcracker. So, um, yeah, he likes, he, likes to, he likes to watch it. At, he likes to watch it a lot, <laughs> yeah. So he, he does that during the show. He watches a lot and um, even um, recreates some of the choreography. Tell yeah. me a little bit about who the characters are, because I believe it's sort of in, in a courtroom. Yes, it, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so there's Hades and Persephone who are, yes, king and queen of the underworld, and this is their space that we're entering into, and it's, it's a kind of... Yeah, it's a slightly kangaroo court, I would say. It's not a very, um, yeah, you know, full of arbitrary rules based on how they're feeling. And uh, then, yes, uh, Medea and Jason come into that space and they are on trial to try and discover what, who, who did what. And um, then there are other, two other characters from Medea and Jason's story. So there's King Aetes, who is... Medea's father, and then there's Glauca, who is the woman that um, Jason falls in love with. Mm -hmm. And when you started creating, you know, you've said maybe the story that we know is just one person's telling. When you're in the studio, do you know how it's going to end? Do you know what the story is going to be? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I would say I don't. Uh, there's a kind of I mean, endings are weird because sometimes, sometimes they arrive and it's very clear and then you're like, oh, that's where we're going. Um, with this one and more often than not, they don't arrive in that way. They're kind of hidden in the mist and you're groping your way <laughs> towards it and then hoping that there's a kind of clarity around that. So, so this feels more, more like this. I feel like myself and the performers, we've been like, what, yeah, what, is, the, what is this ending? And, um, but we definitely put into the space this idea of different endings. And so the Euripides ending is the one that's most well known in terms of Medea, but there's, a, there's other tellings of that story which end very differently. So we put that in the space from the beginning. And I mean, I think you open in a couple of weeks. Have you found your ending? <laughs> Close, yeah, <laughs> yeah, we're getting there, yeah. Just tell me a little bit about the other creatives involved, yes. sound and design and lighting. Um, wow, yes, uh, there's lots of them and uh, so there's um, Jethro who's doing sound, there's Hayler's video design in there as well, uh, and then there's Jackie who's doing the lighting, there's Sutra Gilmore who's designed the set and the costumes, and then in the studio I've been working with Andrea who is over there, who's been kind of assistant directing, and then Wins Burnett Smith who's been assisting with the choreography. So um, yeah, it's an amazing team of people. And yeah, it needs it. I mean, you know, there's this thing where they're in a fantastic group of performers. Most of them, their background is physical dance. One of them's a kind of background is in circus, but th there's a lot of, we're asking a lot, you know, like dance, rehearsing dance, which of course can take as much time as you've got. And then there's rehearsing text and that there's kind of acting skills which are less familiar to them. So, so we're, yeah, there's a lot of time where we're trying to work in different spaces on different things. And, put it all together. Yes, you're saying that so the majority of the cast are dancers mm. and now they're, they're acting, they're speaking. Mm. Why cast it that way around rather than inviting actors who can also move? 
Yeah. Um, I, this is a generalization, but I feel like the, so, so all of them are kind of interested in performing and using words, so it's not like I've thrown them into something that they absolutely don't want to do. Well, they might change their minds, but there, there, there's a feeling of, of that, but also there's this thing around, you know, there's this thing that dance training gives you, which is this ability to remember movement and to kind of have 10% of your brain clocking what it is you're doing. So we work a lot with physical improvisation, and then we're asking people to recreate things that have come from physical improvisation. And I know there's actors who will disagree with what I'm about to say, but most, even like really physical actors, they, that, that thing is hard for them, to remember what it is they're doing. So it's a kind of thing of going, actually, to be able to work this movement and remember what you did physically is incredibly important, because then I'm going to ask you to maybe talk as well or to do something over the top. So it feels, and maybe also I just move more in, in, in the, the dance world, so I have mm. more kind of knowledge of those performers. And but people are, the people you've worked with as well, aren't they? Yes. Like Miguel, I was just thinking of that when you're yes. saying about that, because the first time I ever heard him speak on stage was probably in The Goat, yes. you know, all those years yes. ago. And was that the first time he'd actually? I, I'm not sure, yeah, but I'll have to ask him. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, yeah, Miguel was absolutely someone who, you know, the, the improvisation, you, you pick up on these things and you're like, yeah, you mean, he, he can, he do, can do this, he can do this, yeah. so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, what is, what is the essential thing you're looking for when you're, when you're casting someone? Uh, I don't know. I mean, what am I looking for? I, I, it feels like you're, you're, you're just, you're drawn to certain people and I think that, um, I think with this, Maybe that's true of every project. You're looking for people who are who are open for the. Maybe it's to do with that. I, I, I need I need the, the the experience of working with people who I've had contact with before, so that they know what they're getting themselves in for. And 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 that's a lot. It, it is chaos. Like it's chaos. It, it, and it's a kind of. Are you willing to kind of come in here and to? I ask a lot of them. They generate so much. So it's kind of that understanding, which is why it's very hard to find people like in an audition and it needs to be people who I've spent a bit of time with and kind of we've sussed each other out and they're like yeah okay I'll step into this and I'm like great because yes. <laughs> so, yeah. I think you said to me that the process is quite sort of scattergun you're throwing yeah. ideas out everywhere and then yes. you sort of see what sticks in a way yes it's really scattergun and that can be really difficult for, for people for some people so the, these the group are amazing because it's not only scattergun but it's also changing constantly, yeah. And how do you know when you've got it right? Um, <laughs> you know, if I had my way, I would just keep rehearsing the entire time. <laughs> but probably there's a point where you have to just say, so I'm not sure it's about a sense of getting it right. It's like, that's the press night. There's we a better deadline. stop now. Yeah. Yeah. So have you done a lot of, you know, because we don't do previews in our world, yeah. really, but we're doing a few for you, aren't we? Yeah. Do you normally have quite a few? No, 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 no not that's... normally. I would love okay. there to be, yes, more. more. I'd love there to be more. Yeah, I, I, I think that is a thing about dance. There's this, which theatre has, you know, theatre treats it differently because it's this idea of, it's never, well, for me, it's never ready, but also it's that thing of, like, it's never finished. Mm -hmm. And I only really, you, 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 you discover a whole load more when you put it in front of an audience, and then you're like, oh, it's not that thing that I thought it was, it's something yes. else. And at that point, if it's already kind of disappearing yeah. from you, I find that really yeah. difficult. So no, it is yeah. amazing how it changes, and something like your work, I think, with, a, with an audience yeah. really needs to feel that, and the pace, and where things, where you maybe would delve more into dance, or whether you would exactly. get back into the text. Exactly, yeah. 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 Yes, I'm sure mm. it was still going to change a lot between now and Definitely. The, the opening night. Yes, it will, yes. Well, thank you both very much. Um, we're going to meet the performers in a minute. Kevin, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll say goodbye to you, and Ben and I will uh, we're going over move here. over here. OK, I'll go over here. So we're going to see a little bit of rehearsal. Can you tell us about what we're going to see, what scenes? Um, yeah, so we're going to look at two, uh, two bits. And um, the first bit is kind of quite near the beginning of the show. So it's, there's, there's a kind of setting up of various characters arrive in the space. 
and they're a bit confused about where they are and what's happening. And so there's a bit of like setting up. So the first scene is around that. It's around uh, um, Jason's arrival in the underworld. He's not, he's not entirely uh, clear where he is or how he got there. Um, so that's the first bit. And I should say about the first bit, we have these amazing um, musicians who aren't here this evening. So this first bit is normally played live. Ishani plays piano. And then the second bit, we have live music normally, but it's going to be a recorded version. And the second bit is, is a more, f I know the first bit's physical as well, but the second bit is, is um, near the end of the show. <laughs> yeah, <Go>. there we go. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, if the dancers would like to come on, I'll introduce them. Um, we have Miguel and JD. Oh, oh. JD. <laughs> and Miguel. And Anna Kay. And Maya. And Hannah. And Liam. And please also welcome the assistant director, Andrea Padararu. <laughs> and I will leave you to it. Great. Let's do some rehearsing. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, so we're going to set up for this thing. I should say, like, this is... So we're quite far on in rehearsal, so that normally the first bit of rehearsal, there's a lot of stopping and starting. And at this stage of rehearsal, we're trying to kind of run things through a bit more. So we won't stop them too much, but we'll kind of run through a section, and then we'll talk about it if they do it really badly. Um, <laughs> but uh, yes, is that me? Um, OK, yeah, let's put this in the space and try. Are we going somewhere I bought you this? No. So, oh, what, because he'll just have that on already. That's fine. He'll have this on, yeah. Yeah. So um, Persephone has, has brought a gift from, from the Nutcracker world down into the underworld, which is this very nice tutu. And um, Hades has put it on like this, just to explain why he's wearing a tutu around his neck. Uh, good. Anything else? No. We can start. I'll get out of the way. Oh, Maya's pretending to be a shiny. So a shiny, the piano player, enters at a certain point. Maya is, is being an understudy for Shani, but she's not going to play Rachmaninoff on the piano. That is going to be, um, unless you want to try. No? OK, that, that'll be recorded. OK, great. Come on, Paul. She's asking what you're doing for Christmas. And? And I said you were going to be here, as usual. But she sounded disappointed. So I invited her. You did what? Yes. Bam! Excuse me, can we help you? Bam. This, this is the underworld, which means either you're a Greek hero or you're dead. <laughs> Most likely the latter. Who are you? I, I, I am Hades, supreme god and king of the underworld. Is it fine, kid? This is the form that she's giving you and then you can exit through the door. When she tells you exit, you can express your regrets, musically or physically, but not verbally. Also, if you would like to forget your life, then drink from the drug by the door. If you'd rather hold on to your memories, don't touch it. Is that clear?
welcome here. You have to use the phone system. What do you mean you can't hear me? I mean, let's come here you and let's use the phone. This here is completely soundproof. But you're responding to what I'm saying. We're having a conversation. <laughs> no. No, it's just that in this, in this situation a lot, you see, certain emotions get where you stay, which gives the illusion of a conversation, but actually, I can't hear you. Please enter your four-digit PIN. <laughs> the phone has no button. She's asking for a four-digit PIN, but it has no... If you've forgotten your PIN and would like to speak with an operator, say yes. If you'd rather not, say no. Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. <laughs> yes. I heard, no. Is that correct? No, you don't want to speak to an operator. No, that's not correct. You're not correct. I said yes. Yes, you have just confirmed that you do not want to speak to an operator. Thank you for calling. No, no, wait, wait. I want to speak to an operator. Please, wait. Hello? 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 What's your name, please, caller? Uh, Jason. Jason, surname? Well, it's just Jason, as in the Jason. From the horror movie. What? No? No, uh, uh, Jason and the Argonauts. <laughs> well, I, I want to know where I am. Okay. Are you sitting down? You're looking right at me. Obviously, I'm not sitting down. <laughs> okay, well, you, sh you should sit down. Well, no, I'm fine. Okay, well, you go, Jason. And this is the underwear. <laughs> no, I can't be dead. Yeah, this, is, this is a dream. I'm, I'm too young to die. I, I was asleep. I remember I was sleeping on the beach. How, how did I die? Okay, hold the line, please, call her. Okay, great. Let's pause there. Thank you so much. Great. Very nice. Yeah. Good. <laughs> uh, okay, great. Let's just go. Um, yes, let's go back to the to the physical moment. Yes. Good. Um, uh, yes. It's good. Uh, Anna Kay and JD, just, could we just hear the, yeah, just the very beginning. It's just this thing of the, the space. I know it's this feeling of like, uh, big, yeah. yeah, but, but actually this thing here where it feels, it's better with the live, but this feeling of the feet, this feeling of the feet, like this whole time that I feel like your feet are Ishani's hands. So this, could we just play the very beginning, Amy, is that possible, of the Rachmaninoff? This is all good, yeah.
Yeah, so from here. Yeah. I'm in the way, sorry. Yeah, nice. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, so when I feel that, when I really feel that padding there, then I feel like it's... I'm ahead of it. Yeah, that, then I mean, it's because you're maybe thinking about the space or the kind yes. of travelling in. But the main thing is that, because then it doesn't matter really. Well, it matters, but it feels like you're just, you're just feeling it and it's kind of coming right through the feet and then it feels... Mm. Then the, the pattern is not so important. It's, yes. But it's nice. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, it's good, Liam. Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> uh, just that thing of the, I feel like this first bit, mm -hmm. you know, we, we, so, so the waking up moment of bang, 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 and then you've got the bang, 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 and that bit, maybe don't use this, because I kind of lose, I lose the, the, yeah, I lose the rhythm a bit when you use that, so it's yeah. still that thing. Um, do we know where that bit is, Amy? Or the, uh, ish. I mean, just we could play it from wherever and we'll. Yeah. Uh, this is you guys still now, so you're coming. Maybe like 20 seconds forward, if that's possible. Yeah, it's really nice. And nice when that feeling is not, it's kind of in boom, bang, gang, gang. So not too much in the extremities, but it's like in the torso you're being pulled. Yeah, nice. Yeah, great. Okay, that's great. Um, did you, did, is there anything, anything you wanted to talk about in terms of? We could, um, how much time do we have more for rehearsing bits? We got another ten minutes or something. Um, yes or no? Do you want Do you want to talk about that, or we can go into the? Yeah, maybe 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 the phone bit quickly. Yeah. 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 Uh, that was great, by the way. Mm. Uh, did you? You don't need it. Let's just uh, go through the... So this is a game that Hades plays with every mortal who uh, comes to the underworld, right? So he's obviously enjoying it very much. Um, let's try uh, to build this moment with him more. Um, you enjoying playing this game with him and enjoying his exasperation. Mm -hmm. And then find a later moment when you turn to us and there's this complicity with us. Yes. Enjoying his struggle. So we go, I go from the, um, the beginning or the... Yeah. Um, we're having a conversation 
Enter your four digit pin. The phone has no button. She's asking for a four digit pin, but the phone doesn't have buttons. If you've forgotten your pin and would like to speak with an operator, say yes. If you'd rather not, say no. Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't catch that. Yes. I heard no. Is that correct? No. No. You don't want to speak to an operator. No, that's not correct. You're not correct. I said yes. Yes. You have just confirmed that you do not want to speak to an operator. Thank you for calling. No, no, wait, operator, I want to... Hello? 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 <laughs> Hello? Hello? <laughs> ah. <laughs> thank you. Shall we? Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. That's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. We can move great. on. Great, great. Thank you. Uh, cool. Yeah, yeah. We're going to move on. Uh, OK. So we're going to try this bit now. Um, so this is uh, near the end of the piece. And um, again, this is with live music. This is a moment when uh, Medea is uh, basically attempting to cross over the river, um, the river Styx in order to um, in order to try and get to her children. So there's this rule about if you have money, you need money to pay Sharon to cross the river. And if you don't have the money, you have to spend 100 years on the wrong side of the river. Uh, and her children are on the wrong side of the river. Um, yeah. Yeah, just yeah, just from just from the walk.
and all the figures I used to see. Okay, relax. Thank you. Beautiful. Yeah, great. Well done. Yeah. Really nice. Yeah, it's good. We don't have so much time, but it's just that thing of, uh, yeah, you can feel that little bit of adrenaline, and then those bits get a bit clunky. So it's about how that, that, that breath. No, it's good, though. It's good to have you know, to have you, to get, make them nervous. So, because, uh, yeah, that it changes everything. You know, you get used to rehearsing in a space and then you have to work out how you navigate adrenaline, which makes everything go faster and, and uh, yeah. So you could feel it, the clunks come back without that breath, but it was, it was really nice. Maybe just one moment just to look at that. So the, this Anna Kay ride on the back, which is a moment I love and when, Again, when it's not connected, we kind of miss it. So should we just look at that quickly? And then, we, then that's probably all we've got time for. Yeah. Yeah, okay, relax, yeah. Better, 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 just, just that. Do you want to do that one more time? Yeah. Just that, yeah. Yeah, It always feels like there's enough space. He's there in time, unless it's, you know. Yeah, nice. That's better. That's better. Yeah. Yeah. So it's something about that breath of the up, and then she's going up, and then already she's on your shoulder, and then it's kind of seamless. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think we better finish there with that. Yeah, thank you. Ben and Andrea, thanks so much for your time. We, um, we're finished with you, but not with all of you. If you'd like to come and join me in the centre, actually, first oh. of all, if you want any water, there is water at the side. <laughs> it's amazing to see a piece coming together, isn't it? Um, thanks so much for that. It's really great to see the process going on. I love watching dancers in rehearsal, actually more than seeing them on stage sometimes. <laughs> I like to see the sweat. I like to see the rehearsal fashions, <laughs> all of that. If you come over, we'll have three on this side and, and three here, and I'm going to pass around mics as well. Can I give you a mic, Ben? Of course you can. But to, 
if you come forward, come forward. <laughs> no shyness here. There you go. Great. I know you might be a bit out of puff, but um, thanks so much for talking to us as well. Now, Miguel and Liam, um, I mean, members of the audience might recognise you as former dancers with Ron Bear Dance Company, and that's where you first worked with Ben. What was it about that experience that you, well, enjoyed so much that you wanted to keep doing it? Well, there is something that I really love about working with Ben is, is the kind of a white canvas, uh, I call it. I call him white canvas <laughs> because it's like a space where you just like, um, there's nothing really, um, I just love the endless possibilities that he always allow to happen in the rehearsal and the working process. Um, he, he doesn't come with the ideas like, it have to be this way, you have to be. He always uh, is just so open, it's just so um, open for any accident, any possibility that could happen. For example, um, singing or doing another type of dance or, or really do an orthodox, uh, completely out of the box uh, improvisation and, and situations um, in, in terms of acting and going deeper into things that normally as a dancer, you don't, you don't tap into those areas because you're just doing more movement. Mm -hmm. You just focus on more this type of things. But, uh, but yeah, I always love working with him because he, he kind of um, um, create extensions of, of me as an artist from my experience. Mm. Liam, how about you? Uh, Oh, that's really loud. <laughs> um, I think the thing that uh, made me really excited about working with Ben, again, was that when we worked together in GOAT at Rombe, there was something about, it was possibly the most uncomfortable I've been hmm. as a rep dancer uh, in a company. And like, I think dancers are quite often uncomfortable. But it kind of, the end product was the best reward for how uncomfortable I had been. And I felt very... Uh, held through the uncomfortable process and I then trusted that yeah I'm going to be in places where I'm uncomfortable and I'm going to do things that are new to me and scary but I trust in his directorship that the, re the work will be enough of a result for the level of uncomfortableness I felt <laughs> yeah all the emotions yes, heightened, exactly, yeah. all the risks heightened, yeah. but the rewards also great yeah. too um, tell me about a sort of we'll have to pass the mic over a typical day in the studio, we'll take one over this side. What was the creative process like? What, what were you doing in the studio? Typical day in the yeah. studio. Um, we usually come in around 10 and we warm up together as a group. Um, sometimes we have like a group thing, sometimes it's more individual. We move on to some voice work, getting the voice going, laughing a bit. Um, and then uh, typically we usually start with physical stuff. So there's obviously like you just saw the web there's sections that are a lot more physical. We'll do those in the morning and go through them. And then we tend to work scene by scene with Andrea in the afternoons. Um, and she's been working with us on more specific kind of context behind our characters and how to deliver lines. Um, yeah, so it's usually broken up like that, but it's really dependent on the flow of the Yeah, thing. yeah. and it's a very collaborative process. Yes. You get to have a lot of input. Yeah. And okay, want to add? that's you. <laughs> you want to add? Uh, yes, I, I think that's the nice thing with Ben is that um, we are part of the creation. So, I mean, now at this point, we're starting to set things. But at the beginning, there's a lot of trial, um, asking any skills that you have that are not good enough, and then just making them do on stage, which is always good. So, yeah, I think, yes, basically, it's fine. Yeah. I mean, t so as we were talking about earlier, most of you come from a dance background. You come from circus. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So this is like all new. Uh, <laughs> it's like really nice to be with all these dancers. It's really fun. I mean, I use like talking on stage quite a lot, but and I did a bit of like clowning work. But uh, this like using it's like more character work, which is new and challenging as well. So everything is challenging, but really fun. For mm -hmm. me. <laughs> I mean, do others of you have much acting experience? I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of text to deliver. Mm. Do, does anyone have any acting experience? I've got a bit. Yeah. Because um, I tend to be in a lot of dance projects or theatre projects that forces me to play a character. So the character building and 
developing a character is a big part of the processes of that I've done before. And I have done spoken word things where I have to use my voice. What's for, a bit. for someone who comes originally from dance, what's challenging about delivering text on stage? Projection, especially if you're moving and then have to speak or you're... Ben likes us to move and speak at the same time. <laughs> Articulation. I'm originally from Jamaica, so there's words that I pronounce in a Patwa accent or I don't say phonetically correctly that you have to then learn how to say to an audience of people that, for them to understand what you're saying. And also separating yourself from the character. I find that dancers, when we go to express something, it's very emotive. When, when your character building is a, is a slightly different, it has to come from somewhere, but you can't always be attaching it to something. Yeah, yes. I mean, how have you found the, the acting? What the, how, what's been challenging about delivering text? Anna? <laughs> <laughs> um, I've never actually worked with text before. Um, I've only played a little bit in the studio and it never got into the pieces so <laughs> um, yeah it's really it's really hard to use text and feel like it's still part of a physical thing rather than just kind of feeling like it comes just from here it's it's still part of the physical body um, yeah and again projection and all of those things that are tied up with it and I mean on a basic level I mean you just level of fitness has to be quite yeah. Hi, to be able to project well, and speak whilst also moving. I, I do often uh, speak out of breath in this piece. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 it works, so it's OK. I, I accept that. <laughs> um, tell us, a, we'll stay with you, Hannah. Tell us a little bit about the characters, your Medea. Yes. How did you go about creating that? Who, who is she to you? Um, hmm... She has a lot of similarities to myself, but there are a lot of things that are completely uncomfortable and cringing. Yeah, I mean, I'm still discovering the layers, like we're still discovering the layers of each character and where they've been, their backstory and their relationships, so. Because in the sort of in more kind of popular knowledge, yeah. she's probably seen as, well, she's known as a sorceress or a witch. Yes. Or a mad woman. Yes. I mean, most commonly. I don't feel like a mad woman in <laughs> playing Medea. I feel like she's she's had loads of stuff thrown at her in a way, like we're kind of saving her a little bit. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and can we hear about some of the other characters? Uh, Persephone. <laughs> well, Persephone for me is. Um, I think when we first started building a character, we thought about what I was like and my relationship with my mum and also my relationship with... of being in a relationship and not choosing, cos I don't know if anyone knows the story of Persephone. Give us no. a little overview. <laughs> <laughs> so Persephone is Demeter's daughter. Demeter and... Who's her dad? And Zeus's daughter. And Hades between Zeus and Hades, they decided that... Hades decided he wanted Persephone, so... Those Greeks. <laughs> so he was allowed to have her, and <laughs> she ends up being the queen of the underworld, but not by choice. But she splits between the underworld and being in the upper world because her mother doesn't allow spring to come if she's not there. So for this is the, the story behind why we have our seasons is when Persephone's there to meet a ring spring, but when she's gone, it's winter. Um, and we, yeah, we, thought, we spoke about at the early stages about how Persephone feels about the fact that she can be in both worlds. And the reason why I bring him gifts is because he can't be in both worlds. That was the agreement. So he, I just bring him gifts to be like, hi, but I've been with him for years now, so I've <laughs> gotten a bit comfortable. I'm making a, what they, we like to say, making a good thing, a bad thing, a good thing out of a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm enjoying my experience. Yeah, so although obviously the, 
you know, the, the sort of headline is it's the show's about Medea. Actually, all your characters are investigated. Yes. yes. Or you're all allowed to be multi layered and mm -hmm. you all get a chance. I mean, Glauco, you're the other woman. Maya playing Glauco. I you're, am. You're yes. the other woman. I am the other woman. I am the younger woman that Jason marries <laughs> after Medea. Um, and I get quite unfairly wrapped up in their drama, actually, I'd say. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah, Glauca's quite young and naive um, and yeah, finds herself in this crazy story and uh, yeah, representing the young ones. <laughs> <laughs> Liam, do you want to tell us a little bit about Jason? He's pretty key in this tale. A bit tale. about Jason, yes. okay. Um, so Jason is a hero-ish. Um, or thinks he's a hero and, yeah, does some rather unheroic things, but still regards himself as a little bit of a hero. And uh, I think for me, playing Jason, the really interesting thing in playing Jason is like there's moments where it feels kind of a little bit anti to who I am, and that's where Andrea and Ben have been so helpful. And like, who you, Liam? Who, who I am, yeah, yeah, and finding like ways that I can try and enter that and yeah Anna Kay mentioned it earlier finding ways to enter it that isn't that like taps into something that is in is within you so you have an authentic source supporting your work but it isn't a projection of yourself mm. and that has had many or resulted in many quiet moments in the studio <laughs> like writing down manically in the corner and yeah finding your own dark yes corners. having moments like facing a wall by yourself <laughs> but like yeah this is, is good like yeah, it's yeah. really fun to play someone who you feel like is perhaps like an extension of parts of yourself that you wouldn't usually explore or share with the world. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or let's, my partner, yeah. Any let's hear briefly yeah. from Miguel and JD about your characters as well. My character is uh, King Aetis, uh, king of coaches, father of Medea here. Uh, felt very um, uncomfortable with a, with a new hero coming into my island and stealing my my beautiful daughter <laughs> and then and then how 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 I build this character you know I have uh, two daughters and but I have to imagine that those daughters that are actually two years old and nine months is they are already 19 18 year, years old so it's a good exercise that Andrea have been giving me to practice and, and, and see myself in situations like that, like my daughter just left me and then I haven't seen my daughter after for 10 years, or, or somebody is coming and, and trying to, you know, Jason, uh, a young boy coming to, <laughs> and I'm trying to protect my place. So you're looking into my the future. Your own yeah, daughters. looking into the future <laughs> and then feeling betrayed. And, and there is a lot of like, layers and, and colors and, uh, with this character. Uh, very challenging, uh, even though. Yeah, it has it has some moments that I I have my 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 monologues and so on, but but it's not as heavy on, in text. But it has a lot of like in those moments I have to really really like uncut myself and be there because uh, it's a very strong character. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And last but not least, Hades. Hades. <laughs> uh, well, Hades is like bored in the underworld, uh, so he just creates all these rules that he has fun with. So the character is pretty fun to do, and then yeah, creates this trial idea. So we trial, trialing Medea. We both are on either side, and it becomes a bit of a battle uh, of like who's right, basically, in the story. Uh, and yeah, I mean, Hades is pretty fun to play. He doesn't really care about all these things. I mean, I, I think we want to build up that eventually he gets into the story, but at first it's just a lot of fun to play with this human. Yeah. Well, we saw some of that. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. That's all we've got time for, sadly. Thank you. Thank you. Lost Dogs, Lost Dogs Ruination will be at the Lindbury Theatre from the 1st of December. You can buy your tickets on the Royal Opera House's website. Thank you to all of our guests this evening. Thank you to Kevin, to Ben and Andrea, and of course, to all the performers. And to our audience here in the Claw studio and watching at home, thank you for joining us for this insight supported by Rolex. Good night. <laughs>